Welcome to another moment in the Word. So, are there times in your life when doing right it may be wrong? When you know the will of God, but actually it's not the right time? Well, that's exactly what happened in Moses' life. Somehow or another, Moses knew that he was uh, called to be a redeemer. And uh, yet, he uh, went about it in the very wrong way. We'll see that now as we look at the passage. We're in Acts chapter 7, Stephen's sermon, and we're looking specifically at verse 23 down to verse 25. And so it says, And when he, now this is Moses, was fully 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood how God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood it not. Well, as we look in the very beginning here, when he was fully 40 years of age, why is that so important? Because 40 is a period of a generation. We find that there is in Moses' life, and we defined it, we find it mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 7, that he lived a full 120 years. And it's interestingly, it's divided into groups of 40. 40 years that he was in the court of Pharaoh. 40 years that he was in the backside of the Midian desert. 40 years he was in the Negev, leading the people in the wilderness. It also has been described as 40 years that Moses thought he was somebody. 40 years that he learned he was a nobody. And 40 years that your God should use and make him into someone for his glory. Maybe that's true in your life. And maybe it's also true at the age of 40 that oftentimes men will reflect on their life and question, well, what is my purpose? They look over the first 40 years of their life and they say, well, this is what I've been, but I'm not too sure. And they go through an identity crisis. Well, that's precisely also what's happening with Moses. But it's more than that. 40 in the ancient world was also the age in which someone could take governmental role. And so Moses, being 40 years of age, fully come, he now, as being the second vice regent of, of Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world, now something happens. And what is it that happens? Well, it came into his heart. It came into his heart. It's in the act of voice. In other words, it's not Moses that actually thought on this and said, hey, this is something that I need to do. Something happened in Moses, and it came into his heart. What is it referring to? I believe it's referring to the visitation that he is to have with his brethren. Oh, but that's the object. That's the purpose. What is it that came into Moses' heart? It says, verse 24 of Hebrews chapter 11, By faith, Moses, when he was come of years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. It's by faith. Somehow or another, God, by his Holy Spirit and through his word, had brought this into Moses' heart. He knew there was something for a purpose in his heart. Remember in the very beginning, we saw that Moses was beautiful. He was actually tov, as in the Hebrew. He had goodness. In other words, he had a divine purpose. And perhaps you're looking at your life, and all of us have a divine purpose. God doesn't make mistakes, and he doesn't create junk, and you're just not here as, as a blip. No, there is a divine purpose in your life. What is that purpose? It's interesting now to look at Moses. And he sees it has come into his heart. What is the word heart? Cardia is the Greek word, and it's referring either to the pump, the organ in the center of your chest, or it's also referring to the center of your will. It is also the word lev in the Hebrew. It means the center of being. It is the center of your soul. 
And we see also that Moses, it came into his heart to visit, visit. Oh, that's really interesting. Visit his brethren and the children of Israel. The word visit is really interesting because that word is episkeptomai. Epi is an intensive word, but skepto is the a word we get our English word scopus from. It means to see. And to be a skeptic, in at least the biblical times, was not critical and negative. Instead, it was to thoroughly investigate. It's the same word that's used in James chapter 1, verse 27, where it says that true religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to visit. Episkeptomai, same word. The fatherless and widows. In other words, to do a thorough investigation. Not just knock on the door and say, how are you doing? And then leave or drop off a food basket. No, it's where there is time that is spent. We find the same word that is used back in um, uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 6. And in Hebrews verse 6, it says, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or what is the son of man that you visit? Episkeptomai. In other words, God has sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God come in the flesh, into our existence so that he could thoroughly investigate. He's visited. He didn't just spend a fortnight with us. He didn't just spend an overnight weekend with us. No, instead, he visited with us. Therefore, we have a great high priest who has been touched with a feeling of our infirmities because he has visited with us. Oh, by the way, that same word, episkeptomy, that we saw here in Hebrews, we find also in the book of Psalms in chapter 8, where God has visited, and it's the same Greek word in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. So he then went to visit. He went to do a thorough investigation. Of who? Of his brethren. Oh, this is interesting. Because remember we saw before in verse 21 that Pharaoh's daughter took him and the word for take means that she adopted him, that he was legally now a part of the family of Pharaoh. Oh, but Moses never forgot his roots. And now why is it that he never forgot his roots? Well, remember the first three months that he was raised in the home of Amram and Jochebed, but Miriam said to Pharaoh's daughter, would you like me to call on one of the Hebrew wives and mothers to nurse him? And she called on her mother. And nursing would oftentimes take place between three and four years of age. And Moses remembered perhaps your first memories. Go back to when you were three years of old. So we now find Moses never forgot. And the word that was used for a child, it's brephos. It means an infant. It's not just a child, not an infant, but a brephos. The same word that's used in 2 Timothy. From a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures. From a brephos. You see, it's so important that you're raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And if you have grandchildren, or even great-grandchildren, don't neglect that responsibility and to teach them the word of God. Moses never forgot what he was taught when he was three and four years old. And so consequently, he now visits with his brethren. And that word brethren means of the same womb, Adelphos, to be born of the same womb. In other words, racially, he identifies with the Jewish people. But it's more than that. Notice that there is no period after brethren. Stephen could have stopped there. He went to visit his brethren. No, he then goes on to say the children of Israel. The children of Israel now is defining the covenant. They are the covenant relationship. And notice it's not the, co the children of Jacob, but the children of Israel. Because Jacob was changed when he wrestled with the angel of the Lord. And are you identifying your children? Not racially only but also identifying your children with the Lord, 
That's what Moses is doing, a thorough investigation. And that's what we need to do, a thorough investigation of our family members to make sure that they're really of the faith. Is that your heart and your plea? That's what entered into Moses' heart. And maybe it's the Spirit of God. Maybe it's the Word of God that would call you today to look and to examine. Do each of your family members truly know the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord? And then he goes on and he says, and seeing, now that word Adon is the word which means to see intuitively, to understand, to see more than just simply with what the eyes show. And he saw the suffering. That's what he saw. He didn't just see a whipping. He didn't just see a slave. He didn't just see a taskmaster. What he saw was suffering. And that is something that comes within the heart. Do you see the suffering that's going on in the world? Do you see the suffering that is going on, not because of just political oppression or economic distress? Do you see the suffering that's taking place because of sin? That's what's going on. Because the word that's used there for suffering is adiko. And dik is the word for righteous. And ah in front of it negates it. In other words, there's a lack of righteousness. There is no law. One of the things that characterizes the world today and even the world governments today is there's no law. Therefore, there is a lack of a moral compass. There is a need for the law. What distinguished Israel from all the other nations of the world? God said to Moses in Exodus 19, I'll give you the Torah. I'll give you law. Law is what gives then cohesion, righteousness, exalts a nation. He saw the law. And so what does he do? He defends. That word for defend means he steps into the middle. He intercedes. He becomes the mediator. And there's where the problem is. This is where doing right can be wrong. There's only one God. There's only one mediator between God and man. And that is the man, Christ Jesus. Sometimes we try to rescue others. And when we do, we play God. I can't save anyone. I can't even save myself. It has to be God that does the saving. And so he defends. And what does he do? He avenges. And that word to avenge means he takes vengeance upon. He is going to make right the wrong. And then we find as a result, he smote, he killed the Egyptian. And... As a result, he supposed. Now, we don't have that in the Hebrew text. There is no reference to what Moses was thinking when he did it. So how did Stephen know 1,500 years later? Well, because the Holy Spirit had given insight and understanding. You see, I don't know what's in my heart, and neither do you. That is the prayer of David. Search me, O God. Know my heart, my thoughts. It is the Spirit of God that makes it known. And, and thereby, he was revealed by the Holy Spirit, his supposition. And the supposition is that he thought. He not only willed in his heart, but he also thought. And he thought he was doing the right thing. He supposed his brethren would have understood and that word for understood, they would have put it together. That's literally what the Greek word is. The, the word means to associate, to place together, to connect the dots. And they don't. They don't connect the dots. They didn't understand how that God by his hand, and notice now, God and his hand, in the Greek and also in the English, are associated very close together. You see, you may be the very instrument that God is using to accomplish his mercy, his grace, his peace, and even his salvation in the lives of others. But it's God that's doing it. It's not the hand. It's the one who weeds that, wields the hand. And so he is supposed that they would have connected the dots and realized that he would deliver, that word deliver. So tarry on, that he would be the savior. That's what it means. He 
knew that God had put a mandate and a calling on his life. He saw himself, even as a young man, he was being raised in all the ways of the Egyptians, but he knew that he had a calling in his life, and he knew he was called to deliver his people. What he didn't realize is that that is God's job, more than merely the instruments to accomplish it. Do you see that in your life? And... They didn't understand. They didn't connect the dots. What Stephen is doing here is making a very clear analogy between Moses and Jesus. They didn't connect the dots. In John 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 11, it says, And he came to his own, speaking of Jesus, and his own received him not. They never connected the dots. You see, Jesus came. He defeated the devil and death itself by his resurrection. But because they, the Jews, the Jewish leadership, rejected the resurrection, they never put it together. The Redemptor is Jesus. The means is his resurrection. Have you put it together? Do you understand and not only understand that Jesus is the Redeemer, but that you are an instrument to carry out his great plan of redemption? I pray so. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. And once again, we thank you for the power of it, the hope of it, the peace that it brings, the joy. We thank you, Father, also for the conviction that it brings. Because if we haven't put it together, it is by your spirit it is by your word and is by our humbleness and meekness before you that we can. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.